How are we doing? Good morning. Welcome to the Circus of Life. Is your life like a circus? Yeah, some of you just, yep, sure is, sure is. We've been talking about uh, the circus of life and kind of doing a couple of things. One, kind of talking about the downside. The downside whenever life feels like a circus, it feels like it's crazy, right? We just went out of the circus. We went, you know, let the plates fall, let the balls fall. I don't care. I'm just done. Get me off the merry-go-round, right? So that's kind of the crazy part of the circus. But then we've also been talking about that there are some things we can learn from the circus that, you know, they do some things well. Um, in fact, they do some things really well because they train themselves. They, they're diligent. They're, they're persevere. The show must go on. There's, so there's some great things about the circus that we can also learn from so we can manage and handle the stressors of life. Because when life feels like a circus, oftentimes we feel like we're going crazy because we've not done the adequate training to deal with the stressors we have. So we're going to talk about anger today. So anger, anybody, I don't know, probably nobody ever experiences anger in this crowd. <laughs> you, all, you look so calm and collected today. You look so good. Uh, but, but most of us, right, we can know that there's times, maybe, maybe those times are way more than we'd like to say, that anger gets the best of us. And so we're talking about the beast within, kind of how to tame the beast within. Uh, the, the little videos we, we sh- we've shown you know, over the last few weeks about um, you know, the bear that attacks the trainer, Anybody see that? If you didn't see it here last week, maybe you saw it on the news, in the news just a couple weeks ago. And that bear, you know, I can just imagine being that bear, you know, they, they got this guy that's, you know, trying to make you do things you don't want to do, right? And, uh, and, but watching the video, anybody see the video? It was a little spooky, huh? It's like, <laughs> that bear, like, had him for lunch, you know, he almost lost it. Uh, the bear lost it, and he almost lost it because the bear lost it. Uh, but, you know, anger is kind of getting in the ring with the bear, Anger means I've got I've to deal with it. Now, if you've been in the ring and, you've, and, you're, and the bear is somebody else, somebody unleashes the beast within them, and you're enduring their anger and their rage, that's not a good feeling, is it? I mean, maybe they're, maybe they're not literally biting you, but they figuratively, they bit your head off, right? And that experience, you want to try to, most of us, whenever we experience that with somebody, we have a little more reluctance about our relationship with them, and we kind of at least keep them at an arm's distance, if not a lot further than that. And yet some of us, we can't help it because we're married to that person. <laughs> no elbows, please, right now. No elbows. Not the gift of elbowing. <laughs> but, but so what do we do in those situations? So we're going to talk a lot about that today and kind of try to unpack that, the, the beast within. That's kind of point number one, understanding anger and how anger works. So with anger, we need to recognize there's three levels it hits us. It hits us emotionally, right? Duh, right? Anger's an emotion. And so that emotion, though, is like an overwhelming. It's like a flood, um, whenever I'm talking to someone and I can tell that they've kind of glazed over, I literally, I can see it in their face that, that you know, they're, they're not listening anymore. And usually whenever you're at that place of anger where you're about to rage or you're, you can just almost see the, 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 the blood. Can you just, just kind of see they get, you know, they get more flush? In that situation, we don't hear as well. The fight or flight mechanism kicks in and, and you know, we kind of start tuning things out and all we can hear is the raging thing that we're saying to ourselves in our head. Emotionally, we feel that, right? That emotional intensity. But not only do is it emotional, it's also physical. It's also physical. There's a, there's a physiological effect whenever you're angry. I'm, I mean, li- literally, your heart's palpitating more. Your, your blood is racing more. Your fists are clenching. Your biceps are, are, are flexing. You're, literally, there's a physical thing, and you can see it in somebody's face. Can you, can you recognize when somebody's ticked at you? Mm-hmm. The, their facial expressions, right? Cartoons love to do the grimace, rah, rah, right? They're growling. Right? They're, they're, they're ready to pounce. Anger is happening. It happens emotionally. It happens physically and behaviorally. Behaviorally. Now, that's kind of where it kicks in, right? All those things are happening, and maybe at this point it's under the surface, but behaviorally, whenever it explodes and we behave poorly, Oh, man, we wish we could just go back and take back what we've said and take back what we've done, but you've let the beast out of the cage. I'm sorry, the beast has already done some problems. So we're going to talk about how do we tame the beast, because you can see the beast, can't you? Uh, It doesn't matter how you live each day. It doesn't matter if you work or play. A tried, true barometer serves in its place. However you live, it'll show in your face. If anger and deceit you bear in your heart, it won't stay inside where it first got its start. For sinew and blood are a thin veil of lace. What you bear in your heart, you show in your face. But 
if you are unselfish and for others you live, not for what you get, but for how much you give. If you live close to God in his infinite grace, you don't have to always say it. It'll show in your face. I think it's true, right? I mean, we, we, can, we can illustrate. You can just watch somebody and you can see peaceful or turmoil, Right? You can see if they're, if they're pouting or they're about to pounce. Right? We can kind of recognize you know, what's going on in people just by paying attention to their emotions, their physical, and their behavior. And what I want us to do today is I want us to pay attention not so much to the other guy, but pay attention to ourselves. To ask ourselves, what is it like whenever I'm emotionally kind of losing control? When anger's on the rise emotionally, what's that like for me? Uh, what's it like for me physiologically, physically? What, what sensations do I have? Do I do the clenched fists? Do my biceps tighten up? Do my face begin to kind of grimace? What is the physical effects for me? And behaviorally, where do I cross the line? You see, I think that a lot of times we just want people to behave themselves, right? Behave yourself, right? We do. We just want to tell someone, you need to behave yourself. We tell kids that all the time, behave yourself. And maybe we tell friends or adults we're close with, you should behave yourself. But we can't behave ourselves if we don't know ourselves. And you can't behave yourself if you don't know yourself and you don't train yourself. And so today is really about knowing yourself. It's about training yourself so you can behave yourself. Wouldn't it be nice if we could, by say we're a part of this, this circus, right? The, or the life is like a circus, but that doesn't mean we have to bite one another's heads off. Life is like a service circus, but that doesn't mean we have to let all of our plates drop. That doesn't mean we have to get super intense whenever we want our way. That we can actually learn from what it's like to have made mistakes in the past so we can make improvements for the future. And that's where I want to meet you. I want to meet you with the knowledge that all of us have lost, lost our cool. How many have lost your cool? How many have gone over the top in an anger, anger outburst? Come on, I'll, I'll, does it help? I'll put up almost all my limbs. Get the other leg up there too. Right, yeah, we are. We, we've all kind of experienced, yeah, the, the ramifications of anger and what it does for us. And so let's kind of get the, let's, let's tame the beast, shall we? Let's tame the beast. Look at it, interesting. You look at the first, first, cha first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter four, um, about verse five, it says, so Cain, I mean, this is the first family. This is Adam and Eve and their kids, right? So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why, are your, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. But you must master it. I think it's interesting that God was trying to intervene. God was trying to intervene on Cain's behalf. And the good, no, the good news is, is if you have a relationship with Jesus... He wants to intervene. Amen. He wants to have a conversation with you because he can see it in your face. He saw it in the face of Cain. Why is your face downcast? Why are you so angry? I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no evidence that Cain said, God, I'm angry. God just saw. Jesus knows where you are. He knows where you've been. He knows when your face is telling the story. He can tell when anger is an issue. And God's saying, you know what? Sin is crouching at the door desires to have you, but you, you must be the ringmaster in this case. You've got to kind of get on the, on the side of saying, wait a second, I can tame this temper. I can. And I know a lot of us will say, oh, I, I can't tame my temper. I mean, I just, I can't help myself when I get angry. Right? Have you ever seen somebody, they're just going at it, ah, 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 and the phone rings, hello. <laughs> Have you ever seen that happen? It's like, whoa, wait a second here, right? You've got a lot of control all of a sudden. You see, what we need to realize is that God wants to come and he wants to give us even more control, but it's not control in our flesh and all of ourselves. It's a God-energized control. And part of that happens, part of that happens when we move to that better place when we know ourselves, when we begin to train ourselves so we can better behave ourselves. Here's what anger does. Kind of anger, I would say, in the, you know, murder in the first degree. Anger, anger can kill, right? Anger um, can, can really fuel us and, and, and kill. It builds and then it kills. It builds and it kills. It kind of builds up steam. And, and, then, and you know what? And you, don't have to, you don't have to actually kill somebody to be guilty of anger killing because how many of you have murdered a moment, right? You've murdered the moment. 
right? I mean, things were going along just fine until you, like, something set you off, and all of a sudden, ah, you murdered the moment. All of a sudden, it just killed all the intimacy. It killed all the chance for good stuff to happen. It just destroyed it. There was a guy that was uh, on the beach, and he was going along, and he tripped over a bottle on the beach, and he turned around and kicked the bottle, and it went spinning on the beach, and a little cork popped out, and yeah, you guys, this is a true story, a little genie comes out, you know, woo, and the genie says, did you kick my bottle? The guy says, oh yeah, I did kick the bottle. The genie was a little bit upset at that too, because this guy, his anger, took it out on the genie, she says, you know what, I'm going to teach a guy a lesson. I got to give you three wishes, but I'm going to give the person you hate the most double of whatever you wish for. And so the guy says, you mean my boss? And the genie says, okay, yeah, your boss. I'm going to give your boss, the guy you hate, double of whatever you ask for. He goes, well, I want to be, I want to be rich. Boom, $22 million was in a bank account immediately. But $44 million was in his boss's account. He goes, I'd like some sports cars. Oh, a, you know, a Ferrari and a Porsche. Boom, immediately in his, in his driveway. But four of them in his boss's driveway. And he's thinking, I always wanted to give a kidney. You know, I think what happens when we're angry is we start wishing bad things on people, right? When we're, when we're angry, we start wishing bad things on others. And you can tell when something's kind of brewing inside of you because you just wish the worst on somebody, right? And, and, and if there's a genie, you would you'd be causing all kinds of, you'd be taking both their kidneys, right? If, if you could, when you're angry, because when you're angry, you do things that are not productive. It's interesting. The Bible says, um, well, first let's look at what Jesus says. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, you've heard it said of people long ago, um, you shall not, you shall, that have said to people long ago, you shall not murder. But if anyone murders, he is what? Subject to judgment. But I tell you, if anyone is angry with a brother or sister, he is subject to judgment. You see, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is trying to help us to understand that God's standard isn't just the externals, that you, that you mind your P's and Q's on the outside. God's standard is that you mind your P's and Q's on the inside. God's saying, you see, it, 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 yeah, you might have a manifestation behaviorally, but it starts physically and emotionally. It's stuff going on on the inside. Proverbs says, a fool gives full vent to his anger. Because you know what? Anger not only builds and kills, uh, it, it builds up pressure and it explodes. It builds up pressure and explodes on others. Um, you know, I, I was looking, I, I, I called several people, uh, texting people last night. I wanted a prop for today. And it was, I was so excited, I'm so excited about this idea. Was, uh, you ever seen one of those, those, those water pistols where you fill it with water and then you pump it up with pressure and then I was going to squirt you all today, but I couldn't find the prop. I don't know. Maybe it was good because it would have just probably made you angry. I don't know, but, but you know, it really does. It, it fits the thing, right? We pump, we pump that up. All, all that pressure inside has got to go somewhere, and that's what you do with your anger. You see, anger in the first degree kills. It builds, and it kills. Number two, anger in the second degree Anger in the second degree is about kind of what's going on underneath the surface. And so what, what happens is we don't realize that anger is not, it's like Tina Turner's view of love. You know, what's love got to do with it? It's just a secondhand emotion, right? Uh, well, the truth is anger is a secondhand emotion. Anger is not a first feeling. Anger is a second feeling. And so some of you are angry, but you don't know why you're angry. So this is a part of know yourself, okay? So we want to know ourselves because we can't behave ourselves if we don't know ourselves. I mean, you can white knuckle it for a while, but to have genuine, true change, you got to know yourself to behave yourself. So you got to, you got to know what's going wrong in, in, in your behavior, in your, in, your, in your choices. And so what happens is we feel that anger, and, and that anger is the only thing we're conscious of because it's pretty big. Anger, it's building, it's building, and it wants to explode. But there's something going on underneath that. There's other things that, are, that you need to be attentive to to find out why am I angry. Last week, I, I, I likened this to the Wizard of Oz, right? And I said, with temptation, we've got to look behind our curtain. We've got to look behind our curtain. And it's true with anger, too. You've got to look behind, behind your curtain and find out what's going on, you know, that's causing this anger in me to be building and wanting to explode. Um, you see, anger does a couple things. It diverts and it perverts. It diverts and it perverts. It diverts us from our primary emotions and it perverts our interpretation of the facts. It diverts our primary emotion and it perverts our interpretation or, or view or perception of the facts. So we're going to throw our little uh, our, our blocks up. Um, so 
Uh, if we could, I'm not sure who's on, on, on screen, but if we could put our, our four boxes up, you know, those are some, you remember the boxes? Yeah. Right. So they'll get up there sooner or later. The boxes will, but we've got box number one and box number one is we, we see in here. Yeah. You want to jump to the second one, jump over to the third box with me. Uh, the, we see in here and then we feel, we feel right. And so oftentimes, you know, we saw, I saw the way you looked at me. Right? We see and hear something, and we make interpretations about that. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but we get to this feeling, and we feel like, you know what? They don't like me. I feel rejected by them. How do you feel rejected by them? By the way they looked at me. Did you see the way they looked at me? Right? So all that from a look, you deduce that they don't like you, and they're against you, right? And then you act. You behave poorly. And so oftentimes we behave poorly in our anger. We, we rage, we, we get sarcastic, we get kind of spiteful, we get passive aggressive. We, we, we behave poorly because we feel angry. It's because of what we saw and heard, right? But what we forget and what we're learning, some of you, how many are using this? How many are, are employing it? Nice, there's about eight of you, beautiful. Um, <laughs> well, we're going, for, we're going for broke. I mean, we want everybody to be doing it, but, but uh, we've got about eight right now. And they're saying, and they tell me this, they've told me this, Pastor, you know, I, I just started out, I was telling somebody, you're telling a story, you're telling a story. And part of what we want to do in knowing ourselves is to know what's the story I'm telling. What's the story I'm telling about what I see and hear? Because if I don't know the story I'm telling, I probably don't know the emotions I'm feeling, and I'm going to behave in not the best way. I'm going to behave and I'm going to wish I hadn't done that. I hadn't said that. I wish I could take it back. When angry, you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. When you're angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. Why? Because you felt something and you acted poorly on it. That's what anger does to us. And so we want to get a handle on that. It's interesting because when you think about what's going on underneath the surface, there's always another emotion that precedes your anger. Um, let's take Cain for this. Cain, for example, right? We talked about Cain earlier. Uh, Cain, before he felt angry, he felt hurt and rejected. Before he felt angry, he felt hurt and rejected. And so a lot of us are that way. You know, we've got things that are going on. We explode, we react, we behave poorly. And we're wondering, I'm just, you just made me, you just made me so angry. And part of what right, I want, want you to get to today, hopefully, is to figure out no one ever makes you feel angry. The story you tell about the events cause you to be angry. And so the interpretation, and so what you do is you, you've, got to, you've got to take some, you've got to start gaining some ownership to understand what's the story I'm telling that, that creates maybe the hurt inside. Because when you're feeling hurt inside, it's not surprising that a hurt can morph into anger. That rejection can morph into anger. And here's the deal. If you're rehearsing your hurt, you're rising, you're raising your anger level. If you're rehearsing your hurt, you're going to raise your anger level. I mean, if you jump on the train of jealousy, it's going to be a one-way ticket to the junction of anger. If you jump on the train of jealousy, it's going to be a one-way ticket to the junction of anger. The next illustration in, the, in your notes and from the scriptures is about, is about Joseph and his brothers. Remember Joseph and his brothers in the book of Genesis, the last 10 chapters, 40, about chapter 40 through chapter 50 of Genesis, tells Joseph's whole story, and he had quite a story. You know, he's, he's uh, one, of, one of 12 brothers. Uh, he's just got one younger than him, and, he, and his father just kind of takes a, a, a liking to him more than his other brothers. And so it was just a dysfunctional family. Family. I love the Bible because the Bible gives us the truth. Uh, it doesn't kind of dress it up and make everybody in the Bible look like they're squeaky clean and have it all together. Most of the people in the Bible were not squeaky clean. They were pretty dirty and they didn't have it all together. Uh, and yet God loved them and God touched them and God worked through their life. Do you know what the basic message of that is? Hope for you and me. Hope for you and me. That's right. So the Bible's filled with that. So it shows us right off the bat, first book of the Bible, a dysfunctional family. In fact, Genesis is filled with nothing but dysfunctional families, including that first one who killed his brother, right? There's just a bunch of dysfunctional families. But why, why does God want us to know all about all these dysfunctional families? Because he wants us to fix our dysfunction. Because he wants us to learn from the past. Because he wants us to learn from truth and say, I should do that differently. So Joseph is in this family where there's favoritism. And his father kind of does. He does. The father likes him better. And he's not very coy about it. He doesn't even pretend, right? He just gives him favored stuff. And so Joseph's got this cool coat, right? This multicolored coat. And he likes it. And he thinks it's pretty cool. Maybe he kind of flaunts it a little bit. And Joseph wasn't the brightest kid. He kind of opened his mouth too much in situations. Um, 
and his brothers are, are frustrated with him. And they, they you remember the story? They, they plot to kill him, right? They're, no, they're different than, no different than Cain. They plot to kill him. Fortunately, Reuben steps in, one of the older brothers, and says, no, 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 let's not, let's not do that. Let's just sell him into slavery. <laughs> There's always a better. <laughs> First, human trafficking in the Bible, right? Let's just sell him to slavery. Let's, let's do that instead. <laughs> and so, but look what happened. So their rage, their anger caused them to act poorly because they were telling a story about what they saw and heard. I see dad give him all the love. I see dad give him attention. And they're telling them a story. We don't matter. So look what scripture tells us. It says, when his brothers saw, saw and heard, when the brothers saw their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And here's the thing that was underneath their anger. His brothers were What? Jealous of him. You see, when you jump on the train of jealousy, it's a one-way ticket to the junction of anger. Why? Because you're feeding it. You're fueling it. So do you have a little in your notes? Do I give you that, my little, my little um, iceberg picture? So, so here's a visual, a visual for you to do some work on, right? Because what you want to know yourself. The more you know yourself, the more you can better train yourself, the more you can better behave yourself. Okay? So part of this has some things that are underneath the iceberg, but you might want to add to your, add to your own because you've got a plethora of stuff going on inside you. And so if it's not listed here, maybe it's not rejection you feel. Maybe you're scared. Well, that's there. Maybe you feel hurt. That one's there. Maybe you feel humiliated or frustrated. Maybe you feel something else, but put it under the iceberg or just circle the one that kind of feels right for you. I feel in my marriage frustrated. I feel uh, it, with, with my boss scared. I feel hurt with my sister. I, whatever it is, kind of get in touch with that because you need to kind of know yourself in order to better behave yourself. If I want true transformation, I've got to begin to kind of look at what's behind the curtain. And so when we do that, all of a sudden we start making some sense of this stuff saying, wow, there is things going on underneath I, I, uh, you know, I, I told this story, you know, for, for years with, with, with my spouse, who's a very wonderful person, um, but I told myself that she had too many demands on me, was one of the things I told myself, and that she wanted me to fail. It's a story, and I wasn't even cognizant of that story because I didn't know myself well enough. I just felt angry. I felt angry that she wouldn't let me work and 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 just be passive. I thought, I thought she should just, you know, applaud all my work and, and think I was great and amazing and just ooh and ah. That's what I thought her job was. <laughs> she didn't think that was her job at all. She thought we ought to have, like, quality time together. <laughs> but I was giving all my quality time at work. And I couldn't believe she wasn't for me because I was doing God's work. <laughs> like, oh, what a great thing to be applauding, right? And she was not applauding. And so I was angry at her, frustrated with her. But I didn't see the frustration for a long time. And I couldn't tell for a long time the story I was telling. But if you were for me, you would just let me do whatever I want to do. I was just a selfish pastor. <laughs> she thought it was ironic that I could meet everybody's needs but hers. You see, I was telling a story that, that I needed everybody's approval to be approved. I need everybody's acceptance to be accepted. I needed everybody's love to be loved. That's a pretty tough story <laughs> because I, most of the time I know you're pretty loving, but all of you, <gasps> your affections, could I get them all? <laughs> That's what I was trying to do at the expense of my relationship at home. You see, so when, when, until we can kind of start looking behind the curtain and finding out what's there, we don't really know the story we're telling, and we can't recognize the ramifications that it's having. So what stories are you telling? Um, the third one, anger in the third degree, is, is the fact that anger incites and it spreads. Anger incites and it spreads. So notice what the biblical author does in uh, the book of Ephesians. He tells fathers, his fathers, do not exasperate your children. Circle that word exasperate. It means to incite or to make angry to incite or to make angry, to exasperate. You exasperate me. Isn't that a great word? That's a new vocabulary word for you. You exasperate me. Now you even know what it means, right? Uh, you make me angry. Fathers, do not do this. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. He's saying the part, the part of him is, is that whenever we have anger, our anger can incite, it can cause 
literally a spread of more things to happen in a negative context. Things can, the family can go from bad to worse. Certainly it happened in Genesis. Things went from bad to worse whenever we don't recognize it. Hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. There it is again. A hot-tempered person, what do they do? They stir up conflict. They're an instigator. Um, Proverbs 22 says, don't hang out with angry people. Don't keep company with hotheads. Bad temper is it's contagious. Ever had that happen? You know, someone else was being a jerk, so you join in the jerk parade? Yeah, I'll be a jerk too. I can be angry too. I can be angry right along with all of them. I mean, that's why riots turn into riots. Because there's an instigator. There's a stimulator. There's somebody that's exacerbating, someone that's exciting, someone that's igniting. They're trying to create more flame. I think anger a lot of times is like a fire. And that fire starts, and what does the person do? Oftentimes anger can be incited, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, there's been several studies done about anger. Um, one of those was done by Esquire Magazine and NBC. They kind of joined together, and they, they interviewed, or they, they studied 3,000 people, and they found that, half, and this was done just recently, they found that the half of Americans are more angry today than they were a year ago. Half Americans are more angry today than they were a year ago. So one of the things that they, that they did was they asked this question. Uh, when you read and hear something, how often do you read or hear something that makes you feel angry? 37% said once a day. Once a day, they read or they hear something that makes them feel angry. 31% said several times a day. Mm -hmm. They read or hear something that makes them angry. 20% said once a week. They found that 88% of Americans are angry at least once a week. Are you average? I hope you're not above average. <laughs> I hope you're below average, <laughs> that you're not angry that much. But I don't know how often you're angry, but anger is an, as a natural thing. But if we close our eyes to it, if we don't examine the stories, we're not going to get any better. We're not going to know ourselves, and we're not going to behave ourselves. And we should really do that. We should really behave ourselves, but you can't do that very well unless you know yourself better. Um, interesting to me, I was visiting with a friend about this, um, and... Um, we just talked about how, how vulnerable we are to anger when we are behind the wheel. <laughs> Does anybody find that you're a little more vulnerable to anger when you're behind the wheel? Like when you're driving, you are just, for whatever reason, right, your brain is disconnected, right, from logic and compassion and empathy. Like those things are not present when you're like going somewhere. Because you got somewhere to go. It's interesting. Anger, a lot of times, is simply a blocked goal. And I think whenever we're driving, clearly we've got a goal. You're in, you want to get to point A from, from point A to point B, right? And that, when that goal is blocked, ah, you're like, you know, you're like, you know, bumper cars. Ah, you know, you're doing all kinds of things. Um, so AAA did a study on this because they wanted to figure out, you know, uh, they had some investment in this. So they did a study and they found out that a lot of Americans are guilty of, of, of this. In fact, about 80 percent of U.S. drivers express significant anger while driving. So just check it out. This is just so you know yourself. Okay. So how do you do? Um, are you with the first group? 51 percent said that they are guilty of tailgating when they're feeling a little frustrated. A little block goal. Get just get right up right on them, right? I don't know. This is your test, not mine. 47% are guilty of yelling, you idiot, right? You're going to yell at somebody thinking that that's going to do a lot of good. So you, okay. 45% um, lay on the horn, right? I always think they like me. I don't have a honk if you love Jesus, but I just assume... Uh, and 33% are guilty of gestures. No. I don't know what that one is. 24% block someone off that they're trying to get in a lane. I'm going to get in front of you, right? Okay, how'd you do? How'd you do on the test? Are you five for five? Are you like really, really good at this? <laughs> See, it's really important to kind of know yourself because you're not going to behave yourself if you don't know yourself. 
Right. I got I to gotta recognize, wow, I'm not behaving myself very well because I don't know myself. I don't know what's underneath it. Well, it's a block goal for sure. You're behind the wheel. You've got to go from point A to point B. And you've got to recognize, wait a second, I, I'm, so I'm probably feeling some frustration that I'm not getting there as quickly as I would like to. And so paying attention to what's under your iceberg is about, about knowing yourself. Um, I think this idea, you know, couldn't be expressed uh, very more clearly in terms of anger, you know, ignites and spreads or incites and spreads uh, than what took place um, in an in a early ball game in 1894. The Baltimore Orioles were uh, playing in Boston, just kind of a routine game. Um, you may know this history about Boston. Uh, and Orioles' um, John McGraw got in a scuffle with Boston, the Boston third baseman. And the little the scuffle all of a sudden did what it always does at baseball games. It went from two people to the entire team fighting on the field. Well, then that spread to the stands. And the stands just started fighting one another. And a fire broke out in the stands and burned the ballpark to the ground and spread and burned down another 107 Boston buildings. Um, that's the stand that burned to the ground. It left, I don't know if we have the little fire truck. The, the, there's a fire truck. That this, the fire was going so fast, the fire truck burned to the ground too. They couldn't even move it out of the way. It just was, was ridiculous. So what, what happens? Anger in the first degree kills at murder's moments. Anger in the second degree is it's a secondhand emotion. We've got to kind of pay attention. There's something going on underneath my iceberg. And anger in the third degree is it, it incites and it spreads. And when you're an angry father, your kids are going to become angry. When you're an angry mother, your kids are going to get the leftovers of that. And it's going to incite them. When you're angry at the workplace, it's going to contaminate that environment. You see, whenever we are angry and we're not, we're not knowing ourselves well enough to behave ourselves, it's going to spread. And so let's talk about how to know how to tame the beast within us. How to tame the beast within us. What do we do? Okay, let's give some things about how to turn this, turn this um, sour, sorry story around. Um, to know yourself, you got to kind of figure out where you at, you know, in the whole fight or flight equation. Are you a spewer or a stewer? Are you a spewer? You just like, you know, my water pistol. You know, you just, you just, you just get angry and you just kind of blow up all over everybody. You explode and expect people to deal with it. And you cause problems here and there and everywhere. And people just try to kind of, you know, go around you and avoid you and keep their distance from you because they're never quite sure when things are going to erupt. Are you a spewer or are you a stewer? Right? The spewer, you know, the Bible actually says, you know, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, right? So, you know, people will say, don't go to bed angry. Phyllis Diller said, don't go to bed angry, stay up and fight. <laughs> you know, there you go. Yeah, just get it out, right? Just get it out. So that's the spewer does. Spewer wants just stay up and fight, right? Why go to bed when we can fight? <laughs> I love a good fight, especially when I win, right? And so the spewer is that way. They think they won because they got angry. They are intimidated. They make someone else cower. Spewers, and then later they go, gosh, that wasn't very smart. You're right, it wasn't very smart at all. And so why aren't you knowing yourself better? Why aren't you saying, oh, gosh, I, this is like predictable. I just keep spewing. That's well, if it's predictable, then, then, then recognize, I can know myself so I can hopefully maybe do some work to train myself so I can better behave myself. We need that. Or if you're a steward, you're a steward, you're just like, you, just, you, don't wanna, you don't want to spew, but you don't know what to do with your iceberg. And so you just try to put a cap on it. And it just what happens, it's like, it's like rotten stuff that you've put into a Ziploc bag. You put rotten stuff in a Ziploc bag and you like got an explosion waiting to happen. It's just going to sour and ferment and become toxic and all of a sudden, kaboom, right? It's going to explode. And some of you are like that. You're trying to zip it. You're trying to zip all this stuff inside this little bag and it's not, it's not intended to hold it. It's intended to deal with it. And so you're trying to do something that God doesn't want you to do. And you just keep zipping it and zipping it. And maybe your mother said, zip it, right? And so you do. You don't think you can talk. And so you just become a posture of a steward. You're not a spewer. You're a steward. And you become passive aggressive. It's a little bit like there, there's a, at the airport, there's a um, young man who's just a little um, a luggage attendant. And you know, people pull up on the, on the curb and they give you your luggage and, and the luggage attendant takes it right and gets it going. 
Well, it's a busy time at a busy international airport, and this young man's doing his best, but he just can't keep up with the flow, and he's scrambling around, and one of the guys is probably, you know, a touch late, you know, and he's been, you know, cussing out all the idiots all the way here, and he gets out of the car, and he's just spewing on this kid that's, you know, that's trying to do his best, and he's running around trying to get everybody's luggage and get it all, and the guy's just, you know, letting him have it, and this kid is just really taking it. And taking it well. And another party watching this is amazed. And the guy is out the door on his way to his his plane. And and the guy, the the lady that was watching says, young man, I just got to tell you, you, how, how do you handle that? I mean, he was just terrible what he was doing to you. How do you handle that? You look like you're fine. He goes, well, I'm not really fine, but neither is that guy. Well, she goes, well, I know clearly he's not fine. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. That man, he's going to New York, but his luggage, going to Brazil. <laughs> right? So, so yeah, what a steward, what a steward does, steward does is I don't have the last word, but I got the last deed. <laughs> right? I gotta get you. You don't know what you're you doing. No one you've been got, but I got you. Right? So the, the steward does that. The steward is all kinds of passive aggressive little things, you know, to kind of get even and things they'll say, and maybe not things they say to you. They just things they say about you. So a lot of times you can tell a steward because a steward is not blowing up at the person involved. They're just gossiping about the person that they wish they could blow up at, right? They're letting it out somewhere because you do. Anger, what? It builds and it explodes. And it might come out in little spurts like pss, 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 or it might be right? I don't know. Spewer? Stewer. Spewers! Come on, I'm giving you enough data here. How many spewers we got in the house? Come on. Confession is good for the soul. That's biblical. Okay. Stewards. All right, awesome. Some of you are just liars. You're not all playing. Did they make this fun enough to play? Okay, spewers. Nice, awesome. It's good. It's good to own it, feel it, own it. Stewards. Better, better. Yeah, see, I got to know myself if I want to behave myself. And so you got to kind of get in touch with, okay, what's, what's really going on underneath my iceberg? What's going on? Why am I kind of, why am I, what stories am I telling? Um, so when we do that, we begin to know ourselves. So now here's the deal. We want to check your story. And now what we often have is we have, we have three clever stories that we tell ourselves. Um, so this comes from the good folks of Crucial Conversations, a great little book. Um, my fight or flight series, by the way, went into great detail with all this stuff. Um, but with the, with the clever stories we tell ourselves, right? Box number two, we tell ourselves stories. We oftentimes tell victim, villain, and helpless stories. Now, if I'm telling a victim story, it might sound like this, right? I heard someone recently say, you know what? You know, I, this, this, I'm not appreciated at work. I mean, it's, I hate, I, I, they, don't, they don't see all that I do. And they just want more from me. They don't see the hours I put in. They don't see the length of time that I drive. They just, I, I, you know, I just can't do anything about it. They're just, it's a terrible place to work, and I feel so unappreciated. He's kind of just a victim, right? I'm just, I'm just this victim at work, and it's terrible, and they just keep mounting on expectations and all this stuff, and I can't keep... Whenever you're the victim, it's not my fault, and you feel like there's nothing you can do about it. I just, I, you know, there, it's not my, I just can't do anything. And you tell that victim story over and over. And pretty soon that story, whenever you tell that story over and over, you know what you're doing? If you rehearse your hurt, you will raise your anger. If you rehearse your hurt, you'll, you'll raise your anger. When I'm constantly telling my story. So look into the iceberg. The anger underneath that is a feeling of, you know, not being valued is a feeling of not being considered. That's where the work's got to happen. You see, part of the reason why you look under the iceberg, part of the reason why you want to find out the story you're telling is because you're, you're trying to fight up here with, you know, your emotions are high and it's toxic and you're, and you're, you're not thinking because you're in fight or flight, you're spewing or stewing, and, and that's not going to get you anywhere. You've got to back up the train, you got to say, wait a second, what is the story I'm telling and what's under my iceberg? Am I just thinking I'm a victim here? Because some of you think you've got a victim story. And that might even be your theme. It's going to be your theme of that. You could never do anything. It's just you're always being victimized by somebody. I'm not appreciated. I'm not cared for. Everybody uses me. Nobody gives me anything. You're just a victim, right? It's your story. It might be your theme story. It might be your theme song. What's love got to do with it? Nothing. It's a secondhand emotion. 
<laughs> so, or you might be the villain story, right? The villain story is that guy's the, fu- he's the idiot, right? So the guy that's driving, right? The little cute story I tell about, you know, the mama that's taking her kindergartner to work and she's saying, mama, where's all the idiots? You know, she recognizes, oh, daddy drove the car, drove her to school all last week, right? So everybody's an idiot, right? And that's the villain story. Everybody, somebody else is the idiot. Somebody, it's somebody else's fault. They're the problem. They're the, you know, the person that's causing all my pain. And whenever we kind of have that, that, that story, all of a sudden, you know what? They are the ones. They are the ones. And both of these stories always look back. You know, they're, I've just got all these people that have mistreated me. They're villains. And I'm a victim. Or maybe it's the helpless story. And the helpless story is looking forward saying, I can't do anything. Can't do anything about it, right? I mean, they have so many expectations on me. I mean, they keep asking me to do this and ask me to go there, and I can't keep up with it all. I just, you know, life is, oh, I'm just helpless. And you tell that story, and what does it do? Pretty soon, underneath all that, anger is going to boil up. It's going to be, the, it's going to come up, and all of a sudden, you're exploding, or you're being passive-aggressive in your relationship. Why? Because you're not paying attention to the stories you're telling. So we've got to do that. We've got to find out, you know, know yourself. Know yourself. So number two, you can train yourself. So here's the good news. Here's the good news, right? All, all this stuff is, is, we can calculate it. We can look at it. We can, we can anticipate it. We can start saying, wow, I get it. I am. I'm a, I'm a put the lid on it kind of guy. But then pretty soon it comes out or I start getting snippety. Or I, and you know what happens is, is I jump on the jealousy train and I, it takes me to the junction of anger. And I do. I just ruminate on it over and over again. I mean, if you focus on your frustration, 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 it will fuel your fury. If you're focusing on your frustration over, it will fuel your fury, your anger. It will. So those things are boiling under the surface, but you can train yourself. The Bible talks a lot about training. It's really critical for us to be people that grow in our relationship with Jesus. We've got to learn to do some things differently and do those different things consistently, connecting with God for our strength and power. That's the training thing. Connecting with God for a strength and power. Recognizing God's got resources that are above mine. I'm going to connect with him. Because the more I know him, the more I have access to him in a moment. And I need him in the moment. I'm going to start doing more consistency with that. That's spiritual training. It's about confession. Confession is spiritual training. I'm going to own my problem. I'm not going to blame it away. You can't train if you're too busy with the blame. If blame is your story, then train is not going to be your story. And so I, I can begin to change some things. I can say, you know what? I'm going to start making a spiritual discipline of owning my stuff, confessing. That was, that was me. That was my stupid story. That was me. That was my anger. That was inappropriate. I'm sorry for that. And all of a sudden, now you start training yourself with confession. And pretty soon, rather than something I don't want to say, I can't say, I won't say, it's like when I say it, I'm liberated. It's like it frees me. It frees me from that 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 tyranny of the past and that captivity of my anger, all of a sudden I'm liberated. God wants to liberate you, but you got to be trained. Remember the passage about the fathers? Fathers don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. He's saying that God has resources, but you got to train your kids how to access spiritual resources. In Hebrews, it tells us that uh, solid food, which is, which is really the ability to, to understand the dynamics of amazing love, spiritual food uh, is for the mature. And what has the mature done? Well, who by constant use, that's training, constant use have circle trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. Because whenever you are behind the wheel with your goal blocked, you can't even tell that what you're doing, blocking somebody else out, is kind of evil, Right? When you're driving and, and, and your anger is in, is in control, when you're behind the wheel and you're saying everybody else is an idiot, you know what's happening is you're beginning to kind of, you're telling yourself a story that everyone else, they're not a human. They don't have any goals. They don't have any needs. The only need that there is is me getting to where I want to go right now. Ah! Right? And when that's happening, all of a sudden things are blocked. And, and so we've got we to pay attention and say, wait a second, what's going on? I need to train myself. Jesus said when the student, the student is not above his teacher, for everyone who is like his teacher, who is fully trained, will be like his teacher. And for all of us, if we say Jesus is our Lord and Savior, God wants you to be in training. He wants you to know yourself so you can train yourself 
So you can behave yourself. Behave how? Behave like Jesus would in those difficult situations. Anybody can behave well in a, in a perfect environment. We don't live in a perfect environment. We live in a broken world. And so in this broken world, how am I going to behave myself? How can I begin to kind of correct and change my story so I can begin to reflect God's grace? It might be saying, but pastor, how do I do that? That's easier said than done. You're exactly right. It is easier said than done. And in order to do that, you and I have got to capture moments where we are still, where we pause to look in the mirror and to know ourselves, to think about, is, am I telling a, a victim or a villain or a helpless story here? What's going on under the surface for me? I, I like what um, Psalms 4.4 says about David. It says, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Here's his, here's his alternative. Lie quietly upon your bed in silent meditation. I, I love that. I love that. Because some of you just don't slow down. You don't slow down your thoughts. You don't slow down your life. And so everything's happening at breakneck speed. And you've got all these goals and all these expectations you have of yourself or others have of you. No wonder you get angry. You're feeling a lot of pressure. And probably underneath those feelings of pressure is a feeling of fear of rejection if you don't meet the standard, if you don't meet everybody's expectations. And so no wonder you get angry. You're like, got all that stuff bottled up. And that breakneck pace of life doesn't help. But, but he says it well. When you're lying on your bed quietly, take some time for some quiet, silent meditation. Because all of a sudden, whenever we stop, whenever we just, you know, we're done, the day is done. If you're just not out, you're doing a little review, not necessarily intentionally, or you should, but unintentionally, subconsciously, the anxieties are flowing in because all of a sudden they have you. You can't run anymore and they're catching up with you. And so if I'm going to know myself, I got to still myself and ask myself some deeper questions. What's going on underneath my iceberg? What's box number two? What's the stories I'm telling? I need to reflect. Ask. So down there, I give you a couple things to ask yourself. Ask, you know, what's under my anger and what's the story I'm telling? Uh, James says it well. Your brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, everyone should be quick to listen. Listen to what's going on underneath the surface. Everyone should listen. Listen to what story you're telling yourself. Everyone should be listen, slow, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak. Don't be reactive. Slow to become angry. Stay away from box number four for a while. Don't jump into box number four. Pay attention to box number two. What's going on inside my story? What, what train have I jumped on? What, what rehearsing am I doing of what hurt? What focus am I doing on what frustration? Because it's fueling my anger. So here's an example of that. Um, Saul in the Old Testament, not Saul in the New Testament. There was a couple Sauls. Saul in the Old Testament was a king. A little backstory. So he's king. He's king for a while. And all of a sudden, a new king has been appointed by a prophet, a prophet of God. And so that's David. And David's just a kid. He's just a young man. Um, but God's blessing is on him. His hand's on him. He's a rising star in the kingdom. And Saul doesn't like that. You know, he knows he can't live forever. He can't be king forever, but he kind of like to. He'd like to be king. You know, you'd like to be in charge of everything, right, too, right? We have these unrealistic expectations. So Saul had unrealistic expectations, and he sees this rising star, and look what happens. Now, pay attention to, to, to Saul's story, okay? This is just a snippet of it. Saul was very angry. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. Self-talk going on. But me, only thousands. Well, how terrible is that? Poor guy. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. <laughs> I hope you're not pinning anybody to the wall these days, biting anybody's head off. But you might be doing that if, like Saul, you've got some sorry self-talk going on. Because sorry self-talk just reaffirms a bad story, bad story, bad story. And crazy comparison just fuels a bad story, bad story. Why? Because whenever you're doing comparison, you're a winner or a loser. And if you're a winner all the time, it's because you're condescending to others and pride's an issue. And that's going to have its own downfall. If you're comparing yourself and you're on the underside of that, you're always the underdog and you can never be good enough. And that's going to have some downside as well. And so when you do crazy comparison, you get crazy results. Sorry self-talk 
turns into sorry relationships and rageful reactions do its damage because anger kills, anger diverts and perverts, anger incites and spreads. Proverbs 29, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but here's what a wise man does. He knows himself and he trains himself. But a, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Wise or fool? Know yourself so you can train yourself. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity. God's on your side. He did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. That means God says, I can get you out of your spewing. I can get you through your stewing. I can help you get to a better story if you'll just do a little training. And so all that we do, whenever we encourage people, hey, why don't you join a group or join a team or begin to invest more in your spiritual life? You know what we're saying? We're saying you should really come and train with us. Because when you add training to your life, all of a sudden you start building this, this reservoir of God this reservoir of spiritual strength that all of a sudden will enable you to push past stewing, to get through it, to, to move past spewing and recognize that's not going to, I can look back and say that has not got a good track record. And so I want a new track record. I want to begin kind of training myself to be that person that is paying attention to know myself so I can train myself, so I can behave myself. How do I do that? A few things in close real quickly. Number one is own it. Own it. Uh, look in, address your first emotions and your story. We've talked about that. Because why? Because anger has its consequences. Proverbs says, if someone is hot-tempered, let him take the consequences. So experience your consequences and say, it didn't work very well there. I probably should make some amends about that because if you rescue somebody once, you'll have to do it again. Let people experience the consequences of their anger so they start looking in the mirror, so they can start looking in and saying, what's my story and what's under the iceberg? Redeem it. Redeeming is looking up and asking, um, asking God for help. Uh, so, so part of this is uh, a couple things here. Whenever you're the victim story, just a couple little things here. You can, we'll, you know, we'll continue to kind of build this. this. This is just part of our culture, so just hang out if you're a victim. We love you. Uh, God loves all victims. Uh, and you don't have to be a victim because you can be an actor. An actor says, uh, you know what? I've got a part in this. I've got a part in this. Uh, I keep... Um, buying alcohol for my alcoholic spouse. I'm not a victim. I'm culpable. I'm part of the problem. Okay. Only a person who knows himself can take responsibility for that. Recognize, what am I doing in this situation? I'm not the victim. Um, I can be an actor. I can do something different. The villain you know, needs to recognize people are human. People are human, and I've got to begin to be compassion for the person that I keep villainizing. I keep villainizing them, saying, oh, they're all the problem. They're not all the problem. They're just a human trying to figure out life. And they've got all that stuff under the surface. And they've got all those blocked goals, and they've got all that frustration. And they don't have anybody nurturing them to awareness, nurturing them to know themselves. And so in the dearth of that, in the, in the absence of that, of course they're going to react poorly. They're going to behave poorly. Because our society churns out in the circus of life. It churns out people who are not in touch with who they need to be and who they really are and how much God loves them. And so if you don't stop villainizing them, you're certainly not going to love them. And when Jesus says, love your enemies, what's he doing? He's trying to create a culture of people that are so, so in tune to knowing who they are and their own weaknesses and their own shortcomings. That they've got an immense amount of compassion for others with weaknesses. And so if you don't have much space for the idiots on the road, it's because you need more compassion for the folks on the road. And begin to say, God, fill me with that. Sharpen that in me, God. And with the helpless people, these people, you've got to start seeing yourself as able. I'm able to do something different in this situation. I'm able through God, through Jesus, I am able. And so what do I do? I want to redeem the story. I want to redeem the story. That's God is constantly taking stories. I spent some time with a, a good friend yesterday, and, and um, we just talked about some of, some of his anger and, and uh, processed that. And, and, you know, we talked about the story that he was telling himself. And I said, you know, your story might be 100% true. Because whenever we tell ourselves a victim, a villain, or a helpless story, it's a way of justifying our own bad behavior. 
I justify, you know, being, being late for work because they don't appreciate me enough anyhow. I justify cutting somebody off in traffic because they were a jerk and they deserved it. I justify poor behavior, bad actions on myself because of one of those stories. And so, it's, so we're talking about that. But I says, you know what? Your story might be 100% accurate. Maybe they are a villain. Maybe are they, they're the bad, bad person. But you know what God wants to do? God wants to redeem the story. He wants to redeem the story. Look what Joseph could say. Joseph's brothers were not nice, right? I mean, they went from killing to human trafficking, you know? And that was the, that was the alternative, not a good alternative, right? They were not good guys. But notice what God said. Joseph said this about God. He goes, you, he's looking at his brothers and and when they're going like, oh my gosh, you're probably going to really get us now because now Joseph had all this power. He could have condemned them to death. And, And Joseph's being merciful and he's being kind. And Joseph says, you intended to harm me. Now look at the change of the story. But God intended it for good to accomplish now what is being done, the saving of many lives. You see, whenever you've got faith in God's story, all of a sudden you start injecting redemption into broken stories. We're the church. We're the church. We're the people that should be redeeming brokenness all around us. But that doesn't happen if I don't know myself. I can't train myself and I certainly won't behave myself. But when I do, all of a sudden I can begin to change a story because I've got God's redemptive potential at my disposal. He's the one that fills my heart, that overwhelms me with his love when I don't deserve it. And he wants me to be a conduit and an instrument to overwhelm somebody else when they don't deserve it and change the story in front of me. How do I do that, Pastor? Well, you got to look in, you got to look up, and you got to look out. You got to use it, use it. Ask, how can I join God in accomplishing what is good? Scripture talks a lot about this. Um, We encourage folks, if you haven't got it yet, you can look on your church app, and you can look at um, resources, and under resources, there's a thing called a mega pack, and it's got all kinds of of scriptures that we believe should be guiding our steps and our mind and our meditations, and you can begin to meditate on those, and and so Romans 12 is one of those, and I've, I've got it memorized forwards and backwards. That means... I can do, go from verse 21 all the way back or pull out any one verse at any time. Um, and so when that begins to happen, all of a sudden you start saying, okay, God, your story's in my head and your story's in my heart. God, help me write a new story in my life. I start letting God's story in my head and letting his story in my heart so he can start writing a new story in my, wa- in my walk, in my life. Do not be overcome by evil. And we've got a world full of it. And if you want to tell the evil story, there's plenty of script out there to to jump on. There's lots of evil in the world. But God's called us to be people that are redemptive. People that make a difference in the world around us. And that means you've got to change your story. What am I telling myself? It's my negative self-talk. And I can change my story. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You can begin to inject good into bad places. You can begin to inject right in the middle of a wrong. You can begin to inject grace in the middle of somebody's guilt. You can begin to inject freedom in the midst of somebody's bondage. When you begin to kind of be on the, on the side of right and the side of good and the side of God, all of a sudden you've got redemptive power and potential, but you've got to look in and look up so you can look out at a broken world and say, how can I make a difference? God, Let me join your story and be someone different. The Message Bible says it beautifully. It says, don't hit back. Discover beauty in in just the people you like. Uh, That's what we're prone to do, right? Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if we see our enemy hungry, go buy him lunch. If he's thirsty, get him a drink. Guess what? Your generosity, it's going to surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. You see what God wants to do in you and I? Wants to give us a new story. He wants to give us an ability to look under the surface and recognize our emotions, what's hurting you, what's frustrating you, what's causing jealousy. You don't have to say how you live. You don't have to say if you work or play. 
But a tried true barometer serves in its place. However you live, it'll show in your face. If falsehood and anger and deceit you bear in your heart, it's not going to stay inside where it first got its start. For sinew and blood are a thin veil of lace. What you wear in your heart, you wear in your face. But if your life and heart is unselfish, if for others you want to live, not for what you get, but for how much you can give, if you live close to God in his infinite grace, you don't have to always say it because it'll show in your face. I don't know what's in your heart, but I know what can be in your heart. Jesus. Amen. And he wants to accomplish the good that for you is right now maybe elusive. And it happens as you know yourself. Train yourself to follow him closely. You'll behave yourself better. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we, we want to just recognize, God, that... Um, People that fly into, fly into rage always have a bad landing. And God, we want to be the kind of people that pay attention, that look under the surface, that look behind the curtain and say, wow, that's where I feel hurt. That's my frustration. That's my fear of rejection. Because when we can start pinpointing those areas that are at the roots of our, of our anger and rage, all of a sudden we find a key to conquering those areas and being freed and liberated from them. And God wants to do that in you because he wants to do it through you. And so I want to invite you in this moment just to say, Jesus, help me to know myself more. Enter into prayer with me. Whisper, this, whisper these words. If you, can, if you can sense affinity with our topic today, whisper these words with me. Jesus, help me with my, with my story to redeem it. I need your help. Resist any leaning toward pride. Spiritually, see yourself shift. See yourself lean into humility that says, I'm just going to own it. God, my anger has caused problems. And I want to be better, not worse. God, change me from the inside out. Help me to know myself. God, give me more spiritual passion to train myself. To stay connected here, a place where the training comes so freely and, and it's offered to empower me to know you more. God, help me behave myself because of your presence, because of the new person you're making inside of me. I want you to visualize yourself with the person you're frustrated with or you're angry at. I want you to visualize yourself being the person that embraces them. That may be hard to do. You cannot actualize it if you cannot visualize it. Visualize yourself being the one that buys them lunch. Visualize yourself giving them a drink. Coupon to Starbucks. Gift card to Jamba Juice. Visualize it. So you can actualize it. Lord God, we want to be able to see the things you see. Lord God, we want to begin to tell the stories you tell. That in the midst of a broken, broken, broken world... We can come back and give life and life and life and, and redeem and overcome evil with good. Do that in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So good to see you. Have a great week. Go out and not be angry. <laughs>